All right, the focus of this video is on ways that antibodies are used in lab research, and we're going to talk about um, three different common um, techniques, ELISA, Western blots, and um, immunohistochemistry, or sometimes you'll hear it called fluorescent antibody staining. And ELISA, the first one, um, enzyme-linked immunoabsorbent assay. Um, sounds pretty fancy, but it's not as bad as it looks. The idea is um, you use ELISA to detect the presence of a specific antigen in a sample. So imagine um, a good example is uh, blood or plasma. If you want to know if someone has a certain infection, if you want to know what their blood type is, um, all of those things um, are detecting a particular antigen. You can even use it to measure um, certain hormones, right? Like insulin, um, anything that can bind to an antibody. And the idea is um, these antigens are way too small to see, even with the most powerful microscope. And so it's difficult to measure um, the quantity of them that's in solution. So the way that we do this is um, you're going to use a plate that looks something like this. Um, in a lab, this is a, a plate that's about the size of like a normal size cell phone. And the little wells, each well is one particular condition. Um, the color change thing that turning blue will make sense in a minute. But if you imagine that this is looking down in that well, like attached to the plastic, um, there are a handful of ways you can do this. The simplest version, the direct ELISA, which isn't really used much anymore, but this is sort of how it started, is you attach your antigen to the bottom of the plate, right? We would be looking at the bottom of this well, right, filled with our liquid, and attached to the plastic, you coat it with your antigen on purpose, right? And in this case, um, this primary antibody is just an antibody that we know binds to the antigen. And so if you want to know how much of that antigen is there, um, or if it's in a patient sample like a blood sample, um, you expose your unknown sample or your known antigen to the plate. And if the antigens are there, right, they'll stick to the surface of the plate because we use plastic that generally is um, sticky and binds proteins. And then when you add your antibody to the sample, um, if the antigen is there, the antibody binds. If it's not there, the antibody won't bind. And so in between each step, we're going to rinse with a buffer. And if there's no binding, the antibody will just wash away. Okay, now, the catch is um, we have conjugated this antibody to an enzyme. A little green ball represents an enzyme. And that enzyme converts a substrate that's colorless into a product that has a blue color to it. And so the conclusion is um, if your antigen is present, the antibody will stick. And since the antibody is attached to this enzyme, then when we add the substrate, the solution should turn blue. And so the conclusion over here is, um, in these wells that turn dark blue, that just means that the antibody was there. And if the antibody was there, it means the antigen must have been there. Right? And these cells that did not change color, or wells I should say, um, it just means the antigen and antibody were not present. Okay? You can put this plate in a plate reader that will measure how much blue pigment is produced by shining a light through it um, and measure how much the light is blocked by the blue color. Okay. All of these other versions of ELISA function on the same principle. Um, they just give greater sensitivity. So in the indirect version, um, you use a primary antibody that directly binds the antigen. And then you use a secondary antibody that binds the primary and the secondary antibody contains the enzyme. The only reason to do this is because it amplifies the response because then you get more enzymes present. Right. The third version, um, sandwich ELISA, that's just where you coat the plate with one antibody that binds to your antigen, that's the blue guy. Then you expose the antigen, then you add the primary and the secondary. Um, the purpose of the capture antibody is to pull more of those antigens out of the sample. It just makes the whole thing more sensitive. Right? But the general concept is um, ELISA is really just making a molecular chain. Right? And by a chain, I mean um, you're linking these molecules together. Capture antibody binds to antigen. Primary antibody also binds to antigen. Secondary antibody binds to primary. And the enzyme is attached to the secondary. If any one of your links in the chain is missing, it won't be complete and we won't get a response. And so all you have to do is think of the antigen as the missing link in the chain. Right? And you're just testing for whether that missing link is there, and you can connect all your antibodies together and get a response.
Okay. The second technique that I want to talk about is Western blotting, which follows a lot of the same principles as ELISA. The antibody setup is the same. It's just the way that we treat the sample is different. So to start off with a Western blot, um, the beginning of this is running something called an SDS page gel. That's what this picture is showing. Um, this gel really is like a slab of jelly between two glass plates. And what this person did was um, they loaded samples containing different proteins um, in little wells at the top of each of these um, gel lanes. And then what they did is um, they ran a power supply through that gel, right? So you always put the positive charge down here and the negative charge up top. And proteins have a negative charge, so they run down the gel towards the positive end. That's why you see the proteins separating into these individual bands. Um, each band is a different protein, and they separate by size. So the smaller ones wind up at the bottom of the gel, and the large proteins stay at the top, right? That way, it's more specific and precise than an ELISA because you're separating proteins apart from each other and making sure that you're not getting non-specific binding. Um, sometimes it's a problem with ELISA if your antibody happens to bind more than one protein. Here, we can separate them by size um, to give us more confidence that we're really identifying the correct protein because our size in the gel um, should match the size that we expect the protein to be. All right. Once you have the gel run, um, you do something called a transfer. That's step two. Um, in a transfer, you take your gel and you lay it on top of a transfer membrane. Um, they're often made of something called nitrocellulose, and you stack them flat. And we're applying an electrode again, positive charge, negative charge. But this time what's going to happen is um, the proteins are going to move out of the gel um, horizontally, right? So they're going to be transferred directly onto the paper. And so that nitrocellulose membrane is basically going to be like a carbon copy of the gel. We want to take everything that was on this gel and transfer it to make right, a mirror image on top of our membrane. Okay? Once you have your protein, it's this guy, bound to the membrane, then it's very similar to an ELISA. Primary antibody that sticks to the protein, secondary antibody that sticks to the primary, and then um, you can have an enzyme, just like we saw before, or a fluorescent molecule um, attached to the secondary right, so that we can use it to detect um, some sort of signal and take a picture of it, right? That picture ends up looking something like this, right? So we image the blot, and every one of these black splotches um, corresponds to the protein that we're interested in. Now notice, in the gel that we originally looked at, there were lots and lots of individual bands, right? Notice every lane had, you know, 15 or 20 different blue bands, lots of different proteins. That's because SDS page is nonspecific. Um, you're lighting up every gel, or sorry, every protein that's in that gel, right? Once you transfer to a membrane and add an antibody, it becomes specific. Um, only the protein that your antibody recognizes is going to show up on the Western blot, right? Again, this gives you much better specificity. You avoid all those nonspecific proteins that you don't want to look at, right? Now, in this example, um, these are all different um, lanes showing the same protein. Um, they just ran, these are different cell types, the different cell culture types. And then you can quantify it, right, by taking those bands and zooming in and using something like Photoshop um, to measure the density of those pixels, right? You take the pixel density, right, how dark the band is and how many pixels there are total, and you can convert that into a bar graph um, that quantifies how much is present, right? And normally we compare the proteins that we're interested in um, and compare them relatively to some stable protein um, or control protein. It's often called a housekeeping gene, um, something like beta actin because all cells make actin, um, and we use that as a way to normalize it and make sure that we're comparing it to the total amount of protein that was loaded in the well, um, just in case you didn't load the exact same amount in each lane. Um, you normalize it to the amount of actin as a way to standardize the data, um, and that's how it winds up um, being shown in a graph. Okay, so Westerns are great for quantifying protein, but they require you to rupture your cells and break them into pieces um, so that you can add the lysate to the gel. In um, imaging using antibodies, right, fluorescent imaging isn't as good as being quantitative, but it shows you positioning inside of a cell. So again, same concept as ELISA and Western. You have a cell with a particular antigen that you want to image. 
and your primary antibody binds the antigen, secondary antibody binds the primary, and now we've attached to our secondary antibody some sort of fluorescent tag that will emit light when we put it under uh, a fluorescent microscope. And so in these pictures, um, you're actually seeing staining with two different antibodies. Um, the green staining is um, staining of microtubules. Um, you can see them forming the mitotic spindle in the cell. And um, the red stain was an antibody staining histones, which are found in chromosomes. Um, so you can see the red chromosomes lining up on the metaphase plate, right? And in theory, you can use this to study the location of any protein in a cell as long as you have an antibody that binds to it, and then you can conjugate that antibody to some sort of fluorescent marker. All right. Okay, hope this was helpful. Um, and uh, follow along in the playlist. The next video after this is going to cover using antibodies as medication to treat conditions like you know cancer um, and Alzheimer's. And it's pretty interesting. So um, follow along, flag the playlist, and subscribe to the channel um, so you get all the videos and series.